It's working right? Good, thanks. All right, um, Book of Numbers. This is our outline, of course. We are in week seven. Today we do deal with numbers, which I have called in the desert. Last week I said in the dessert. I corrected that. It's now in the desert. Uh, of course, where else would you want a dessert but in the desert? But um, So, numbers today. Next week in the first hour we will deal with the book of Deuteronomy, which is giving Deuteronomy short shrift, but there's never enough time in an eight-week course. And then the second hour we will deal with the final exam. If any of you, when you review the materials, the what you should know about the Pentateuch materials, and have any questions, feel free to give me a call or email me. I will be happy to you know, answer anything I can if there's if something about this is confusing. And as always, I recommend that you all study the materials and take the test, even if you're not doing it for credit, because it's part of the educational process. And hopefully studying the notes and taking the test does help you learn this stuff and remember it. I, I, for those of you who have taken previous classes, Am I fair in saying that taking, studying for and taking the test actually helps you learn the stuff? Yes. 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 Okay. I think that that's a help. So if you're, you know, I recommend that to you, even if you're not doing this with credit. Okay. So the Book of Numbers. It's a strange book. Um, the Book of Numbers is quite different than the rest of the Pentateuch in several ways, and I'm going to get into that. We, of course, would maintain the traditional view that the book of Numbers, along with the rest, the other four books of the Pentateuch, uh, was written by Moses, the lawgiver, that he wrote it, and probably he wrote the books when they were wandering around in the desert, which is the thing that's, that is the focus of the book of uh, Numbers. The theme are the census of the people, the history of the people during the four wanderings, and I, I think I would add a word to that, and uh, that is really the theme of Numbers is Preparation. The one word, preparation. Initially, in the first ten chapters, the people at Mount, are still at Mount Sinai. They're being prepared to go in and take the Holy Land. And then when they prove not to have enough faith to do so, they spend 40 years wandering around in the desert. And then time in the plains of Moab, which is to the east of Israel, the nation of Israel. Well, we know it's Israel, east of Canaan at that point. And they are prepared to enter the land again. That's sort of the book of Deuteronomy. But throughout, there is a census or counting of the people, there is a retelling of the history, and there is preparation for what God has planned to them. Um, and so a key word, wanderings or preparation, the purpose is to show uh, what can happen when God's people rebel against him. You know, God had made great promises, we'll talk about that, but when the people fail to believe that God will fulfill on his promises, then uh, they acted in rebellion, and the book of Numbers is... 40 years, or about 38 years and 9 months, we believe, of wandering around before uh, they were able to enter the promised land. Again, we'll talk about that. A rough outline would be the first 9 chapters uh, have to do with a census and the results of that census. The first 4 chapters is the first census. There's also another census in chapter 26. Then we have Sinai to Canaan in chapters 10 to 12, the transition from being at the foot of Mount Sinai, where they receive the law, to... Uh, they think they're traveling to the land of Canaan, but when they get close enough and they send out spies, they refuse to accept that God will bless them and fulfill his promise to enter the land. And so God's judgment against them is that they will wander in the wilderness near Kadesh Barnea for um, as long as it takes for the entire generation of adult Israelite men to die out because they had no faith. The, there are only two exceptions in terms of... Uh, Israelite men who were allowed to enter the promised land, that's Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua were allowed to because of, of the spies that they sent into the land. Only Caleb and Joshua came back and said, we can do this. They had faith that God would, would direct them. And so they were the only two men. So that it took them 38 years and 10 months for, nine months, for a whole generation of adult Israelites to die out before God would then allow them to enter the Holy Land. And then you have the last chapters at Moab when they've actually finish the wanderings and they go up and they're in the plains of Moab, that is the Transjordan it's called, it's east of the Jordan River, preparing to cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land. Okay, so that's the general kind of outline. Let me give you another way of cutting this. I've done this with several of the books. This little, um, little diagram, which you've seen before, for uh, Exodus, Leviticus, etc., there are three areas of focus, and for the most part, Numbers is seen as broken up into three parts. The old generation, the tragic transition, the new generation is one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at it, uh, I mentioned preparation. Preparation, that is 
at the preparation at the foot of Mount Sinai, postponement, the delay and wandering caused by the lack of faith, and then preparation again as the new generation prepares to enter the Holy Land. The primary way that the book is broken up usually is in terms of locale, and there are three parts to it. Again, it starts out at the foot of Mount Sinai after the law has been given, after God has declared his covenant commitment to the Israelites. They then leave there with the intent of going on to Canaan, to the Promised Land. They get up close to it and send out the spies. They end up not having faith that God will fulfill his promise to them and allow them to be victorious in taking the land. And so they wander for almost 40 years. That's the wilderness section, which as you see, 30 years, 3 months, 10 days. Then you have the plains of Moab, which is after that generation has died out, they move further north and they prepare to actually cross over. And that's about a 5 month period. So you add all of this up and it ends up being about 30 years. Um, and actually, I think that's a typo. That should be 38 years. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and I didn't type it. So it should be 38 years, 3 months and 10 days because he ended up... Uh, uh, 38 years and, and uh, nine months, roughly, is the time period. And we base that upon uh, when, at the start of Numbers, it tells us they're here at, at Mount Sinai, or they, they actually it's a, a repeat of something that was said in the previous book about when they arrived at Sinai, and then when the tabernacle was given, we have a dating on that, and then when they left there, and then when they entered Moab. And so you add up the various numbers, and it ends up being 38 years and 9 months. So, the book of Numbers begins at Mount Sinai, as I said. The Israelites are there, they've received the law through Moses the lawgiver, the man that God has anointed to be the leaders, to bring them up out of slavery in Egypt. Um, they have... Had, they have agreed to, and God has established with them, the covenant that they will be his people, he will be their God in a very special way. This is the point more than any time before. Now the promise was made to Abraham, was renewed to his son Isaac, was renewed to his son Jacob. Um, all the way along, God has been promising from Abraham on that he would create a people, and that they would be a special people. But now, here at Mount Sinai, God has declared the the details of that covenant. In other words, God is saying, I've been promising this since Abraham. Now is the time of fulfillment. You are my people. I am your God. And here's how that relationship is going to work. You know, last week we, um, we looked at Leviticus and Leviticus, end of Exodus and Leviticus, very much talk about, okay, how's this going to work? We've got God and we've got us. How are we, how's that relationship going to work? Well, that is sort of affirmed in the book of Numbers. And the people are prepared to move forward to claim the promise that God has given, uh, to move forward and claim the land, and particularly because God has literally, in the presence of the tabernacle, he has taken up residence with them. God has said, I will be present with you. Now you remember in the, uh, in the golden calf incident, God said, all right, I'm not going with you anymore. I'll send an angel along, you know, I'll send, I'll, I'll send one of my assistants, but I'm not going to be with you. And Moses pleaded with him. We're going to talk later about intercession as a major theme in Numbers, but also throughout the Pentateuch. Moses pleaded with God to still be present with the Israelites, and he finally conceded and, and agreed that he would go along. Um, and his presence was in the tabernacle. The design of the tabernacle, which included a central chamber, the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and uh, the top of the Ark of the Covenant, where the two cherubim's wings came together, was called the Mercy Seat, and God literally said His presence would reside, the presence of God would reside above that Mercy Seat. And that presence was reflected as the Israelites um, are in Sinai, and as they prepare to move out at Mount Sinai and prepare to move out, by the pillar of fire by day, and the, or the pillar of fire by night, and the pillar of cloud by day. God was present with them. And that presence is another major theme I'm going to come back and talk about. So this is where they find themselves. They are, at this point, the various themes that have been introduced in Genesis, that is, in, in the book of Numbers, we find the various themes that have been introduced in Genesis, in Exodus, and in Leviticus, all begin to find fruition. Because God had specifically promised the Israelites that they would be a great nation, and now they are. He promised them that they would have a special relationship with Yahweh, their God. And at the in, in uh, Leviticus, Exodus and Leviticus, God had defined that relationship. So that's coming to pass. 
And the third promise that he'd given is that they would take possession of the land of Canaan. So those three things, that they would be a, uh, become a people, a great people, that uh, God would be present with them with a special relationship, and that they would take the land, all of those promises that, that started with Abram, Abram, Abraham in Genesis, and worked through Exodus and Leviticus are now all coming together in the book of Numbers as they begin to move forward. Now, the book of Numbers especially demonstrates the importance for the people to maintain holiness and faithfulness and trust in God. God has made all these promises. He's demonstrated that He's for them, that He's going to protect them, that He's going to take care of them. He brought them out of slavery. He gave them water when they needed water. He gave them uh, manna and quail when they didn't have any food. He protected them from the Amalekites and other enemies. God has miraculously proven that He's going to fulfill His part of the deal. But the book of Numbers is the story of how even though God is present with them now, God has shown His plan to fulfill these things, still the Israelites lack faith. They lack confidence that God will fulfill and will give them the power to possess the land, and so they fall short because of lack of faith. And that's the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is how it happened that the Israelites showed a lack of faith and what God did about it. Okay. Um, now, particularly the book of Numbers, um, I mentioned 38 years, 8 months, a few days. It's basically 9 months. Um, it starts out Sinai, it, the people move north, and they end up spending 38 years. Now, I want to give you a perspective here. I'm going to show you a map in a few minutes. But the first, the place that they go to, which is, ends up being kind of a pivot point that they, they wander around, I think I've said to you before, some people say the reason they wandered almost 40 years in the desert is because they're being led by a man who would stop and ask for directions. It's a little more complicated than that. But um, Kadesh Barnea, which was sort of the center point of their wanderings, the place where all of that kind of started, if you did a, a, a trip from Sinai, where they started, up to Kadesh Barnea, it would normally take about 11 days. If you took a more direct route, it might take a few days less than that. There was a typical route that they would take along the Gulf of Aqaba, along the water. Okay? Um, they could even get there shorter, even if they went by way of Edom and Moab, in other words, a western uh, or an eastern route, and came around. It still wouldn't be more than a couple of weeks. Well, it took them 38 years. This is the, the significance of their lack of obedience, of their lack of faith that God will fulfill the promise to him is that a trip of, that should have taken them 11 days took them 38 years. And they continued to wander in the wilderness. It, the book of Numbers is a story about uh, not only God's faithfulness, but more particularly about the people's unfaithfulness, about their rebellion, apostasy, frustration, complaining, um, every imaginable thing in their lives they whined about and grumbled about and complained about. We'll go through that a little bit as we talk about the content. Over against that, we see a consistent reflection of God's faithfulness, His presence, His provision, His forbearance with them. You know, even though a couple of times God gets angry enough, you know, He gets angry enough to make them wander in the desert for 38 years, but there's, with the golden calf incident, and then when they initially refuse to accept uh, Caleb and Joshua and instead decide they want to go with the, the skeptical spies, um, God is prepared to destroy them. And Moses intercedes and says, no, you know what? If you brought them this far and then you kill them, the Egyptians are going to say that you couldn't, you were not powerful enough to take them into the land, so you just brought them out here in the desert and then decided to destroy them out here. And quite literally, Moses is saying, God, that's not going to make you look very good. All right? That's going to be a bad witness for you. And so God, God decides not to destroy them. And his final decision is, all right, I'm not going to destroy you. In fact, I'll continue to be present with you. But you guys, you adult men, are not going to make it into the promised land. You will die out here in the wilderness. Only your children will see it. And that's the result of all of that um, lack of faithfulness on the part of the Israelites. Okay? This is probably, I think, the key verse. If you had to pick one key chapter, it would be chapter 14 in uh, Numbers. 
Now, it's, it, numbers, as I said, is, is kind of complex. It's kind of a strange book because there's a lot of complex different things going on in terms of literary form and sections. We, we uh, painted in terms of the three large sections, which are the locales that the Israelites are in. But the pivotal chapter is chapter 14, because this is the chapter when, after the spies bring back their reports of what the land of Canaan, the promised land, is like, the majority of the Israelites decide they don't trust God, they don't believe he will bring them into the promised land, and so they want to go back to Egypt. I uh, don't know if you ever heard that many, many, many years ago, so the Christian song, so you want to go back to Egypt, and it talks about wanting, you know, wanting to eat leeks and garlic and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's actually out of the book of Numbers. They said, oh, if we were back there, you know, we'd have really good pizza, basically. It's, you know, with leeks and garlic and, you know, all kinds of wonderful things to eat. Instead, we're out here in the desert. Um, but this passage in Numbers 14 probably is the pivot point, that the, and therefore the most critical verse. Starting with verse 19, I, then Moses said to the Lord as earlier, because uh, I wanted you to see the context of who's saying what here. Moses said to the Lord, in accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as you ask. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. This is a... a they challenged God so many times. It wasn't exactly 10. It's just like his way of saying a lot. Every time I turned around, these people were, were questioning me and testing my, my faithfulness. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. That's why the wandering. And so this, these few verses are kind of the central pivot point. Uh, it's almost right in the middle of the book. And it just defines what the whole focus of the book of Numbers is all about. Um, any questions about that? Look, yes, Suzanne. They, they were still living a long time at this point. How, how old was Moses when he died? Um, Moses was 120, I think. I think he had three periods of 40 years. There was 40 years between... Uh, the time that he, you know, was born and the time that he was in Midian, there were 40 years, um, uh, I'm sorry, between the time he left and 40 years between the time he th then and the exodus in Mount Sinai and then 40 years in the wilderness, so about 120. So a lot of the people that he brought out would have died earlier than what was a normal lifespan? Well, um, perhaps. It's, it's also true they were living in a very rough place. I mean, the, the wilderness, the desert of sin, as it's called, which is a fascinating name, um, is, is a very difficult place. In addition to that, from time to time, they would do something and 14,000 would die from plague. Or there was a, you know, the plague of serpents that came amongst them, and, and many of them died. And so there were various other factors going on, but much of it would have been that they were living in one of the harshest environments in the world. And I'm sure that while it doesn't give us a lot of details about that, I'm sure it took a toll. Uh, and so overall... The people were dying at that rate, but you're probably right. If you assume that they were 40 or 50 years old when they came out, let's say some one of the men was 40 or 50 years old when he came out of out of Egypt. Ordinarily, he might have lived another 50 or 60 years or so. Ordinarily for them, not for us. Um, and yet, for after 38 years and 10 months, they all of the old generation had died out. So my assumption would be that that had something to do with the fact that. They were in a very harsh place, living a very hard life, uh, living on quail and manna most of the time. You know? uh, so, in, right? in your opinion, would this apply to the children that came out of uh, no. Egypt? As well? No, no, no. It's the adult men had to die, of, not the children. It's not like everybody died. The point was the people who were responsible for making the decision, the people who, who demonstrated a lack of faith in God because they were the ones who were going to decide, were the adult men. And of those adult men, there were only three of them that trusted God. Moses, Moses didn't make it to the promised land, but it was not because of his lack of faith in God's ability to give them the promised land. But he died for other reasons we'll talk about. Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua did go in. In fact, Joshua became the leader of the people. He had been a young man, an assistant to Moses, when, they, when the exodus happened. Uh, but he was still an adult. They were the only two adult males. But the point is that 
at the time that they actually entered the Promised Land, the, the Israelites were made up of what had been young people when they, when they arrived at Mount Sinai, before the lack of faith was shown. So the children were the people who went in. Uh, but the adult males had to die out. Okay? Anything else about that? Okay. Um, let's look at some details about the book of Numbers. The title Numbers, which is kind of a strange one, comes from the Greek arithmoi. Now, originally this book did not have a title. Um, they typically didn't title books in the Old Testament. You will remember, or in, in that time period, rather, um, in, in ancient writings, they usually would use the first name, first word or a couple of words of a book uh, in the book to call it by that. Um, it didn't have a title, and yet when they translated the Hebrew into Greek in the writing of the Septuagint um, in the third century BC, they broke this up into, into the five books. It had been sort of broken up before. I've told you that the, the indication is that the five books of the Pentateuch were originally intended to be one document. But they simply are too long to effectively put them on a scroll. You know, it, it wasn't easy to work with if you had that much content. So they broke it up into five pieces, numbers being one of them. Well, that individual piece did not have a name by itself. If they wanted to refer to that as a scroll, they would have used the first uh, word, which in Hebrew is bimidbar, which you'll see uh, the second section down. The Hebrew name bimidbar, which means in the desert of. Those are the first Hebrew words, and that's what it was called originally. It didn't have a technical name beyond that. But when they translated it into Greek for the Septuagint, they called it arithmoi, which means numbers. And the reason they called it that is because there's two accounts of a census in this book. Chapters 1 to 4 is the first great census. That is of the Israelites while they're in Sinai. And it's a census of the number of fighting men they had. You know, how big an army could they feel if they needed to? And then... After all the 40 years of wandering, they have another census in chapter 26 in which they're counting how many people do we have now that the old generation is dead. You know, this is 38 years later plus. And so how many do we have now? And I'm going to talk about the numbers question in a little bit. But um, it's called numbers because of the two great census. In the start of the book and in chapter 26, before the wilderness wandering and uh, for almost 40 years and after. All right? Um, the major divisions, as I said, are predominantly seen as focusing on the locale where they were at the time. First at Mount Sinai, that's the first ten chapters, and then you get uh, in the wilderness itself, and then on the plains of Moab as they're preparing finally to cross over into, this is where Moses dies as they're preparing to enter into the land. Now, each one of these has a connecting section, or a, con a concluding section, which talks about moving from one place to the next, okay? At least after the first section at Mount Sinai, there's a section which concludes, which talks about pulling up stakes and moving on to the next location, which would have been in the wilderness of Kadesh Barnea in the north and preparing to go into the Holy Land, um, into the Promised Land. And then at the end of the wilderness wandering, there's a section, a concluding section, that talks about leaving the desert of sin and moving up into the plains of Moab. Then you have the section of Plains of Moab. The end part of, in the, of the Plains of Moab, the concluding section of that, does not involve them moving somewhere else because that's what the start of the book of Joshua is. The first chapters of the book of Joshua is about the, the people of Israel under Joshua's leadership now, going up to the Jordan River and having faith in God as he instructed to cross over the Jordan miraculously. Uh, in very, very similar... There's a real parallel here in the book of Joshua. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to the historical books class. Joshua is the leader. God tells him to walk forward, and he has the, the priests pick up the Ark of the Covenant. The priests are responsible for carrying it. They walk forward, and Joshua gives them instructions, as God had told him. Walk into the water until your feet are wet, and then God will show us what he's going to do. And you've heard me say before, that's where we get the expression, getting your feet wet. Go ahead and move into something and see, see that's how you get started. Well, once they did that, God rolled back the water of the Jordan River, which was a significant river. So there was dry land for them to cross over. Now that is an echo, a very intentional echo, of the crossing of the Red Sea. In the same way that the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea was the, the absolute proof that Moses was God's man and that God was there with them, 
with Moses as his, as his representative, God does the same thing with Joshua. This is the start of Joshua's leadership and ministry, and he rolls back not the Red Sea, as in Moses' case, but the, the Jordan River. And so you get a clear parallel there. So Joshua gives the story of how they left Moab and went to the next location, into the Promised Land. And instead, in Numbers, after the presence in the plains of Moab, we have a section where it sort of goes back and replays. There, there's a quick replaying of every place they've been so far and what all's going on and you know how God has brought them this far. Again, in preparation for going on to the next place, but it's not a travel uh, record like the ends of the first two sections are. Does that make sense? Are you okay with that? Um, let's talk a little bit about what some of the major content in each of these sections. First we have the period at Mount Sinai. They've received the law, they've been given God's promise of covenant, they're there, and the very first thing in numbers we have is that God says, count the number of men that you have who are uh, available for military service, okay? That's the first census, and it carries over really into the fourth chapter. Then, as part of that census, they identify the census according to tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. That number 12 is critical throughout all of Jewish history. And Jesus, when he chose 12 disciples, nobody would have seen that as anything other than the, a, an echo of the 12 tribes of Israel that had been so important all the way down through the, the life of the uh, people of God, the chosen people. In fact, it was a, people would have heard that as a clear sign that Jesus was creating a new Israel because that was the way the old Israel was structured, and that's how the census is done. The 12 tribes. Now, in the process, when they identify the tribe of the Levites, God makes clear again that the Levites are to be set aside for priestly duty. The sons of Aaron will be especially responsible for sacrifice, but all of the tribes of Levi have the responsibility to be the, um, the, the priestly people and to have various other responsibilities related to religious practice. This is why last week we talked about the book of Leviticus, which means according to the Levites. That's not the only thing that's in Leviticus, but that's part of it. You will also remember that after the golden calf incident, Moses draws his sword after expressing his anger and breaking the first two tablets he had. He draws his sword and he says, any who are for God, join me. And the Levites join him. And then there was a massacre. Moses and the Levites took their swords and they killed a significant number of people as judgment against all the people who had uh, worshipped the golden calf. That act of joining with Moses and declaring that they were on the side of God against the worship of the idol, that, that cemented the, the place of the Levites as being God's priestly people, that they were the priestly tribe. Okay? So we have a very specific identification of priestly duties. Um, Numbers 4 through 7, that's chapters 4 to 7. More details about the priestly duties, definition of the camp, um, and of what constitutes unfaithfulness. We have an example of a, a man who's caught gathering wood on the Sabbath, breaking the Sabbath, and he has, he's uh, punished by death, you know, to, to emphasize the significance of this. To us, that sounds like, you know, really? The guy was gathering wood on Sunday and you killed him for it? But the Sabbath was, you know, that was one of the big ten that they had just received there at Sinai. And to blatantly violate it was an offense to God and to the covenant that they had. Now, of course, the whole Israelites regularly break that covenant later on. But this is the time in which they're still, they're still settling into this thing. They're still uh, uh, verifying the significance and importance of the covenant promise and the law that God had just given them. Uh, and the, there's... The pledge of the Nazarite is given. Nazarites, we believe that Samson later on was a Nazarite. We believe John the Baptist may have been a Nazarite. And, the, the, uh, and those two were different because they were Nazarites their whole life. The vow of the Nazarite is in numbers is given as a way if someone really wants, usually for a temporary period of time, not for life. John the Baptist and uh, Samson were unique in that, that they were lifelong. Um, if they really felt a call to pledge themselves to God more intently for a period of time, there is a process whereby they can take the vow of the Nazarite. It involved not cutting your hair, not drinking any 
wine or grape juice or eating raisins, no fruit of the vine was allowed, and various other disciplines, and you would carry that out, not allow yourself to touch any dead body under any circumstance. Um, so that is all outlined, and it was a way God was saying, if you find yourself in a place in life where you feel that you really need to focus spiritually for a time, here's a process by which you can be helped in that. Okay, that's what the vow of the Nazarite was all about. Now again, um, Samson, Nazarites were not allowed to cut their hair, Nazarite being a person who was under the vow of the Nazarite. They couldn't cut their hair, they couldn't drink alcohol, all kinds of things. Well, you remember what it was that finally took Samson's strength away. His hair got cut. Uh, partly as a result of him falling in with a, a foreign woman, okay, Delilah. Um, you'll remember that it talks about John the Baptist ne never drinking uh, alcoholic beverages. Again, those are different reflections of the vow of the Nazarite. So um, that's given, and then the tabernacle consecration. There's this long process, which takes, uh, I think it's 10 days, where each day a different one of the tribes come. The Levites aren't, don't participate in that. Uh, but each day there's an act of consecration by the tribe to the tabernacle. Um, now, the tabernacle, when we talk about God's presence being among the people, this tabernacle, which was a tent, which was the holy place and the holy of holies, the most holy place, with a courtyard around it of curtains, which was more portable. You know, they could pull up the stakes, you know, pull down the curtains, take up the stakes, take off the walls, carry all this stuff to the next place and put it back down again. But that tabernacle was literally placed right in the middle of the tribes. There was a design that God gave to Moses in which the... Uh, the, on the north side, three of the tribes were to camp. On the south side, three of the tribes were to camp. On the east side, three of the tribes. On the west side, three of the tribes. So the 12 tribes of Israel very literally encircled the tabernacle. And since that was the location of the presence of God in their midst, that literally meant God was in the center. And that all of them were in a circle around it. There are also very specific instructions that when it is time to leave, then here's the order you do it in. So that there was an orderly way of getting in and out of this camp. Not just like, okay, everybody, let's go. And you get 12 tribes coming from four different directions, all trying to take off at once. Um, the, when the tabernacle was established, the, direct, the instruction was, when the cloud of God is settled on the tabernacle, you know the presence of God is there. When the cloud lifts, it's time to go. So God very specifically and clearly was telling them, uh, how do you know when you stay where you are? How do you know when you leave? And how do you know when to stop and where to camp? That wasn't just somebody trying to figure it out. The cloud, which represented the presence of God, gave them the instructions on whether or not it was, it was over the tabernacle or whether it had lifted and was moving away from them. So God was present in all of that. Uh, numbers 8 to 12, Levite, the journeying by cloud and fire, as I said. Um, then we, we get places of complaints and questioning of Moses. These people complain about everything. Everything. You almost would have thought they were Presbyterians. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, they, they complained about Moses' leadership and about the food and about not having enough water and about you name it, and they complained about it. Um, and... Moses, for the most part, was very patient. God was very patient. There were very few times that, that God lost his patience with them. And only once, really, that we know of, that Moses, well, um, Moses really lost his patience beyond the point that God wanted <clears throat> at Meribah. But earlier, you know, obviously Moses had gotten very impatient in, in Leviticus when they worshipped the golden calf, uh, or in, uh, Exodus, I mean, and he smashed the first tablets because in, in anger, but rightfully so. And God did not hold that against Moses because God was feeling about the same way right then. But all of these complaints, for the most part, Moses was very patient with the people. And he interceded for them to God. And God was very patient and forbearing and continued to give them additional chances. Um, we then have the second section, which is in the wilderness. At the very end, when, when the under Numbers 8 to 12, and it says journeying by cloud and fire. There's the section in there, which is the concluding section of the first, uh, the first part, where they, the movement, you know, the travel log between leaving uh, Mount Sinai and going up to Kadesh Barnea and the wilderness area, okay? 
Well, they get to the wilderness, and the idea of stopping there is to send scouts or spies, they're sometimes called, ahead, to, uh, to scout out this land of Canaan. Well, they go up and they discover that it is a rich, you know, a land of milk and honey, which is what they told them they were going to be, and nobody doubted that. In fact, they brought back fruit from the land, and this, the, the illustration is that a cluster of grapes was so large that two men carried it on a, on a uh, pole between them. So they brought back all this fruit and said, man, this place is great, but the people there are giants. You know, they are really large, they are very, um, very powerful armies, the cities are large and fortified. They sent out 12 spies, 10 of them, and they spread out and went to different areas. 10 of them came back and said, there's no way we can take this land. There's no way we can defeat these people. In fact, they even go so far as to say, some of them are the descendants of the Nephilim, this mysterious thing we have in Genesis where the Nephilim are described as being you know, the products of the sons of God and the, and the daughters of uh, Adam. Kind of, and we don't even know exactly what all that is, but the suggestion is that they were almost like gods. Well, they were, this may have been an exaggeration on part of the ten of the spies, but they were saying, these guys are like, you know, like almost gods. They're so powerful and big. Becky? Um, are there other writings of that time that, that spoke about the giants and things like that, do you know? Um, not that I'm aware of. There's some other records okay. from back then, some Mesopotamian records and things like that, but I don't know, it could be, but I don't know of any other record that talk about that. Now, when they say giants, I don't think they literally mean, you know, like, like uh, Harry Potter giants. I think they mean men that were 6'6 six, six or 7 feet or, you know, looked like giants to them. Yes, John? I think, I think it, 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 I read somewhere where it refers to uh, they were men of nobility. Well, that's the, the Nephilim. Uh, one of the theories is that the Nephilim may have been, and they talked about sons of God and the daughters of men, and the sons of God may have been those that were of noble family, particularly maybe those who were descendants uh, of the, the righteous line of Seth, as opposed to the, the non-noble line, which would come through, uh, you know, through Cain and Lamech and, and that line. So there are different theories about that, but we don't really know. But in this case, whatever they, really, they saw, 10 of the 12 spies reported back that these guys are giants. And they've got giant fortified cities, and there's no way we can take this land. Caleb and Joshua come back and say, absolutely, we can take this land. Yeah, all, all, everything you're saying is true, but God has told us that he is with us, and so we can take the land. Well, they decide, the Israelites, the adult men being the ones who made the decision, decide that they can't take this land. And in fact, they start talking about electing a new leader, not Moses, in other words, a new leader that will take them back to Egypt. And that's where they start rehearsing how great it was, you know, in Egypt. All the things we had to eat, you know, leeks and onions and garlic. Just get this idea how it must have smelled, in, you know, in those camps um, from, from eating all that kind of stuff. Okay, that was a joke. You know, <laughs> onions and leeks and garlic and, and all the other things. Uh, but they want to go back. And um, God's judgment against them is he's not going to let them go back, but he's also not going to let them go forward because of that rebellion. I was just Marvin. sitting here reversing in my mind, you know, they were in Egypt, they saw the ten plagues, um, they went across the Red Sea, they saw Absolutely. the Egyptian army destroyed, and they forgot it. And they saw the miraculous provision of food and water, they saw the Amalekites defeated, um, and on, and I mean, they stay, they were so, they saw such evidence of God on the mountain, that, you know, with rumbling and shaking, they said to Moses, okay, you can talk to God, but don't, don't make us talk to him, because if we try, we'll die. They had all of that still. They would not believe that God would take them where he had promised to take them. Because now it was finally time for them to go into the land and actually fight, rather than just observe God doing all this. Exactly. And, you know, we do the same thing. I have a specific case I'll tell you about. Um, real story. I'm not going to use any proper names because this is going to be on the internet. I had a friend who worked for a bank and he had a really good paying position in Seattle. And he had felt for a long time that God was calling him to go to seminary, get a degree, and go to ministry. And he actually had some good contacts at, at, a, at a seminary not too far from us. 
And we got together one night and we were talking about it. He said, I'm really struggling because my, my bank has offered me a very lucrative position back in, and he was from a state in the South, back in my hometown. Um, I, I mean, it's a plumb position, but I feel God's calling me this other thing. What should I do? And I said, well, you know, um, there is the biblical model of putting out a fleece. That is, say to God, if, you, if this is what you want, then give me evidence of that. Show me, because I'm a, I'm a poor, dumb sheep. That's the way I think about it. I'm a poor, dumb sheep. I need you to show me. Well, there's a biblical uh, evidence for that. Well, he and I are talking about finding God's will and seeking God's will. We were at a restaurant where we're on the, we're on the uh, level, and then there was a, st a level up, and there were these little cafe curtains there, so we couldn't see the people up there, and they couldn't see us. Well, I said, you know, put out a fleece. And he said, well, he said, you know, in two weeks, I'm going to a, a reunion. And I was not a Christian when I was in college. And he said, there are people there who, who would know me as a hellraiser and, you know, troublemaker and everything else. And he said, so I think the fleece I would put out is that if somebody comes up to me and, and affirms to me that my faith, my testimony, my witness meant something to them, it affected them, that they were, they were benefited from that Christian witness, that would be a sign to me that I should go into ministry. And I said, okay, I think, and we prayed for like, you know, a couple minutes, just laid that before the Lord. We're continuing to talk about it. Three minutes later, I exaggerate not, as I stand before the Lord, this is the truth. A woman walks up to our table from the cash register. She said, excuse me, gentlemen, I hate to interrupt you. I, I, I was just paying my, my bill to get out. But a few minutes ago, I was sitting up here, uh, right above you, right at the table right above the curtains here. And I want to tell you to have two adult men sitting and talking about the Lord and talking about seeking His will and wanting to do the right thing. She said, I was really moved. I am really inspired. I'm a Christian. I haven't been that great a Christian. I really was moved by that. And I just, I felt after I paid my bill, I want to come back over and tell you that. So she wasn't there when we talked about the fleece part because we had just said that. Um, his fleece was answered. Right there, right then, you know, within five minutes of us saying that, he took the bank job. He didn't go to seminary. And I said to him later, what is wrong with you? What has God got to do? Walk up, you know, slap you right in the face? And I'm not picking on him because, you know, one way or the other, we can't, we can't hold the, too much of a grudge against the Israelites because we do the same thing. And that was a case where my friend... He laid a fleece before the Lord. The God answered it less than five minutes later, and yet he still went the other direction. We do that too. Okay? Um, I haven't heard from him in many, many years. So I hope he's doing all right. But this was the case where they said, even though God had promised, even though God had given them every indication in the Exodus and all the different pieces of it, they still did not believe that God would honor his promise to them and give them the land that had been promised all the way since Abraham. We then have very specific kinds of things like Korah's rebellion. The, the, the Korah was of the one of the branches of the tribe of Levites. And so he had a, a group of people that followed him. And there are two other names that were mentioned to uh, Dana and uh, 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 Bima, I think his names are. They come to Moses after the decision that they're not going to you know, they're not going to go into the promised land, and they want to go back to Egypt, and they've said, we want to elect a new leader. Well, the Korahites come to Moses, and, and they say to him, basically, by the way, who do you think you are? You're not the only holy one around here. And you get the sense, because you'll notice earlier, there was a big emphasis on the fact that the Levites were specially selected to be God's representatives as priests. These are part of the tribe of Levi, and they come to him, and they say, we're holy too. Who tell, you know, who said you could be the boss of us? And so they challenge Moses. And it's in this point, there's this wonderful little parenthetical statement. It, said, it says, Moses was the humblest man alive. I think it would be pretty hard to be humble if you had been the man through whom God did all the things that he'd done, you know, um, the plagues and the Red Sea and all the rest of it. Uh, but, but Moses falls on his face. And he says, tomorrow, bring your censers and put coals in your censers and come out here. You be here, I will be here, and God will tell us 
who it is that's his, that's his man, his leader. The next day, they come together, the Korahites, and they bring all of their, their families, their wives, their children, everybody else. Moses is there, and Aaron and Miriam, the others. And God opens the ground and swallows up the whole group of the Korahites and their families. Um, he demonstrated very clearly. And Moses, Moses didn't, and Moses got upset at one point. But Moses didn't curse them. He didn't draw his sword and attack them or anything else. He said, okay, let's, let's line up here tomorrow morning and we'll see who God chooses. Who it is that is God's person. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering if there were, there must have been survivors of the sons of Korah. <clears throat> where I mentioned in Psalms quite a bit, dedicated to her. Very possibly. Uh, I, yeah, there, there had to either be other parts of that clan or that name must have meant something else, and I'm not sure which. I'd have to look that up. Something else I don't know, so we'll, we'll look for it. Um, as a result of, of that rebellion, there was also a plague. Some of the people that didn't get swallowed up but had been also inclined toward rejecting Moses and finding other leaders, there is a plague. And finally, um, God inspires Moses. He said, okay, you want to decide who's calling the shots here. Let's take everybody, let's take the leaders of the different tribes, the major leaders, and in order to see who ought to be in charge, since they thought in terms of tribal groups, you know, the leader of a tribe uh, would, would be the primary person, let's, let's take the staffs of all those people and let's put them in the tabernacle and see what happens. And whichever one... Uh, buds, in other words, these are wooden staff they've been using to walk with. Whichever one starts, shows life and buds, then that's who it is that God wants to be in charge. Now Moses didn't use his staff, but Aaron was, you know, his brother was working with him, they were family. They put the staffs in there and it says the next day, they go in and Aaron's staff, of all, none of the others, anything that happened, Aaron's staff had not only budded, it had blossomed and bloomed and it had almonds on it as a sign that Aaron, as the high priest, and Moses, because Aaron and Moses were together in this, were the leaders, and they were the ones to follow, to move forward. And so, this sort of thing happens consistently, where something will flare up, and, some, and then there has to be a, a sign of God in terms of punishment, but also an indication or sign of God of what his, his will is after that. We have several different cycles of that sort of thing going on, okay? And in this case, the destruction of the the members of the tribe of the group of Korah, the family of Korah that rebelled, a plague, the budding of the Aaron staff, and then the affirmation again of the Levites, what their duties are. Um, then in Numbers 19, we have a passage about an act using a red heifer as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And there's a process there. We then have water from a rock. And this is where, and this is in Numbers 20, where Moses um, disappoints God. I don't even want to say anger is because God does not speak angrily to Moses. But God gives instructions to Moses that the people needed water, and they were complaining about that. You know, we don't have enough water. So God said to Moses, go up to this rock and speak to it. And when you speak to it, I will send forth water as a sign of my grace and of your authority as my God. Well, Moses is getting so tired of this whining he doesn't obey God. He gets mad about the, the whining and frustration and grumbling. And he goes up and he takes a staff and he strikes the rock twice. Which is not what God told him to do. And he did it in anger. Water comes out, but then God said, that's not what I told you to do. The suggestion is that the way Moses was acting, it was as though he was kind of taking credit for this working. You know, and He was doing it his way, and when water showed up, I'll show them, you know, I'm tired of the grumbling. And God said, that's not what I told you to do. You don't have the right spirit about this. And there, there will be consequences. It was because of that, act, that single act of disobedience on Moses' part, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. There may have been other factors as well. The fact that he was 120 years old, and they were getting ready to enter the promised land where they're going to have to be fighting battles. And Joshua was, was, was the military leader. Joshua was the one that already had fought battles. He fought the Amalekites, etc., uh, he was the next one to be leaders, and so it was time. But this is the particular reason why God said, before they, when they were in Moab, God said, go up on Mount Nebo and look across 
and you can see across the Jordan into the land of Canaan, and he could see the land that was promised, but he was not allowed to go over. Okay. Um, Miriam then dies. Uh, there, there's a place earlier, by the way, where both Miriam and Aaron even get frustrated with Moses and get jealous about Moses. First, they get mad about Moses because he has a Cushite wife. In other words, he has a wife from Arabia, which was the land of Cush. Um, he has a, a Cushite wife whom they don't like, so they get mad at him. Then they start feeling jealous toward him, and they start trying to undermine his authority as well. Uh, well, God says to all three of you, come into the tabernacle courtyard, and God speaks to them. It says particularly to uh, Miriam and Aaron, all the other prophets that I've ever had, I spoke to them through dreams and visions. Moses is the only one that I speak to face to face. I don't, I don't talk to him in riddles. I don't make him figure stuff out. He doesn't give you know, metaphors for things from me. He is my guy, and he speaks for me. And you are fighting me when you fight him. Well, as a result of that, Miriam breaks out with leprosy. Okay? She's leprous as a judgment against her jealousy and her undermine, trying to undermine Moses. Moses intercedes for her and prays, God, heal her. Even though her punishment was because they had tried to undermine his authority. And so God does heal her. He does say, um, in fact, there's an interesting little passage. God says, well... If her father had spit in her face, she would be unclean for seven days. Well, in effect, I'm her father, and she has offended me, and in judgment against her, she has to go outside the camp for seven days, and at the end of seven days, she will be healed, which she was. So she's, she's exiled from the camp for seven days, then she's allowed to come back, and her leprosy is cured. But, you know, uh, it's only because of the intercession of Moses that God kind of removed his judgment against her. Yes? Is Miriam Aaron's wife? Right? No, Miriam is the sister. Miriam, Aaron, and, um, and Moses. And, and I think in that order, I think Miriam was the oldest three, because you remember when Moses was born and was put in the, in the bulrushes, you know, in the basket in the bulrushes and in uh, Pharaoh's daughter, yes, yes. Miriam is the older sister of Moses, and she's watching him. And when the Pharaoh's daughter takes, Miriam is the one that runs over as a, as a young girl and says, I know of a Hebrew woman who is, uh, can be your wet nurse, you know, who can nurse this baby for you. Uh, do you want me to go get her? And Pharaoh's daughter said, sure, because I need somebody if I want to take care of this baby, because I, you know, I don't have any milk. And so that was Moses, Moses and Miriam's mother. And, I, and uh, uh, Aaron, I believe, was in between. He may have been older than Miriam, but Moses was the youngest of the three. Okay. Um, well. Miriam dies and is buried. Aaron dies and is buried. buried. There are various uh, conflicts between various peoples. The Edomites don't want them to cross through their land, so they decide that they're going to instead go a different direction. They end up fighting the Amorites, various other ites that are throughout this period, this place at that time. Um, there is another case where because of rebellion there is a, uh, a plague of serpents, poisonous serpents that come among the people. And again, Moses intercedes, and God says, make a, a, a bronze serpent and lift it up. And when you lift it up, anybody who looks at it will be healed of their poisonous bite. Again, Moses' intercession and God using a sign, not just saying, okay, it's done, but rather doing something that's visible, visual, so that the people know that this is something God is doing. Okay? Um, and then that... that brings us to the end, and at the end of that time, we have the next sort of con conclusion or travel log that takes them from the wilderness up north to the plains of Moab. And let me give you, before we take a break, let me give you a picture of that. I'm going to jump ahead, okay? This Egypt, this whole thing down here, the, the Nile River, Goshen, which is the land to the part of Egypt where the Israelites lived, and again, we don't know their, their exact track. Um, I'm beginning to be more inclined to think that they may have actually crossed the Gulf of Aqaba here, which is part of the Red Sea, and have gone up this way. But, and that would have meant Mount Sinai is not here, the traditional place, which is Jebel Musa, which was identified by St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Emperor, uh, but rather maybe over here, Jabal al-Laz, which is an ultimate location for Mount Sinai. 
Either way, they then came up here to Kadash Bardia, and then, you know, for 40 years, they're doing this figure eight uh, up here. Then, after the time in the wilderness, the 38 years in the wilderness, they ended up going back up through Edom. Uh, they, were, they were denied passage through Edom, and the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, uh, Jacob's brother. Um, these are all descendants of Jacob. They're all part of the tribes of Israel, and Jacob's labor name was Israel. So Edom would have been their relative. The Edomites would have been their relatives, but still opponents, just like Esau and Jacob were opponents. They sort of skirt Edom and go up here through Moab, up into, uh, you know, past the Dead Sea, up into the area of the Ammonites, and then cross over the Jordan River to Jericho, which is the first location right there. So this is where we are in the wilderness, and then at the end of the wilderness section, we have them traveling north into Moab. Let's take a break for 10 minutes, and we will come back together. I've got right now 2 o'clock. We'll come back together at 10 after. I want to talk just a few more minutes about the third section of uh, Numbers, and then deal with some of the themes that are important in Numbers. Once they get to the plains of Moab, and the plains of Moab, as you, as you saw from this, the plains of Moab are up here. This, this is Canaan, here, what we know of as Israel today. The plains of Moab are over here, just on the east side of the Jordan River, from, from Canaan. All right? So they had traveled up, they were parallel to the land of Canaan that they were going to enter into, and, uh, but in the plains of Moab. So once they get there, as they're traveling up, they have an unusual experience that I'm going to talk about more in a minute when we talk about principal themes, and that is uh, the story of Balaam's donkey and blessings. We usually know it as Balaam's ass, where Balaam is a prophet, a Mesopotamian prophet, who is asked by uh, the king of Moab to curse the Israelites, and instead he blesses them. Um, and in the process, when he tries to defy God and not listen, then an angel walks away, from the, and the donkey can't move forward, and Balaam is beating on it, telling him, go on, go on, go on, and the donkey talks to him. You know. Um, in order to tell him, why are you beating on me? Can't you see the angel, dummy? Um, so I'll talk about that story in a little bit more, what it means in a minute. We then have, uh, and, and the, the, the big, there's a major theological point behind all that that, that I'll touch on. Then, Numbers 25 to 29, we have the story of Phineas. What had happened is they get to Moab, and they're there for a while. And like they often did, the Israelites look around, and they go, man, these, these girls around here are pretty. And they start dating and having relationships with Moabite women. In one case, against God's will. In one case, a, an Israelite man walks right through the middle of camp in front of Moses and God and everybody with a Moabite woman and takes her into his tent. And they are having a conjugal visit in his tent. Well, Phineas is a, a young man who is righteous to God and is so offended by this, he takes a spear and goes in, and there's a very dramatic scene where Phineas takes this spear and he jabs it down through the Israelite man's back and all the way through him and into the stomach of the, of the Moabite woman underneath and kills them both as an act of judgment against this because, God, because the guy was so blatant about it and God had told him not to do it. Well, because Phineas did that, God decided to withdraw his judgment of all the Israelites because there was one, at least, in Phineas who showed righteous indignation on God's behalf. God sort of stepped back from the judgment he was preparing to, to uh, give against all the Israelites. We then have the second census. Again, remember, we're already past the long time, years of wandering in the wilderness. All of the original adult men have died out, and so they have a second census to see where we are now, once we have a completely new generation. They talk about the inheritance and how the land will be divided up once they get over. They, they have a, a casting of lots kind of thing to divide up the land, but it's based upon population. Um, then there's discussion of uh, Moses' successor, and God anoints, uh, or appoints at least, that Joshua will be the one to take over after Moses. They have offerings and holidays and celebration. There's a discussion of vows. There is the uh, insistence by God through Moses that the Midianites must be destroyed. And it's while they're in the land of Moab that the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, these are three of the, of the 12 tribes, 
they say, you know, we kind of like it over here in Transjordan, in the Moab and uh, Ammon, these areas that are east, not part of the, the original plan for the Promised Land, but east of the river. They say, we like it here. Can we just stay here? And Moses says, you can stay here and claim your right to the inheritance here on one condition, that you go with us to conquer the rest of the land, because we need you in order to be able to be victorious. If you will join us in conquering the rest of the land, then yes, this can be your inheritance. And so they kind of settle there, but then their armies, the armies from those two and a half tribes, go along in order to conquer the land. Um, and then finally, Numbers 33 to 36, the stations of Israelites' journey, what they do is it's sort of a, a remembering of all the places they had been and all the things that had happened to them. It's kind of a, a, a retrospective of all of their events. Final instructions for conquest and an identification of cities that the Levites, since the Levites are not going to be given plots of land like the other tribes because their job isn't to farm or run herds, uh, their job is to take care of the temple, but they do need to have some place to live and they have to have some, some, you know, they deserve to have homes too and so certain cities were assigned as Levitical cities, the, the cities of the Levites. Um, and that's where we end up with it, with them on the east side of the Jordan River. Moses dies and uh, is buried on Mount Nebo after he is taken up there by God to look out over the, the land and see all that God had promised. But he is not allowed to go across to it. That's the outline, again broken out into the three large sort of geographical locations that they find themselves in because this is a, it's a book about travels, about wanderings, and so it's broken up that way. Any questions about that? Before I talk for a few minutes about some of the problems and themes. Yes? Do we know what the Levitical cities were? Yes. I mean, we have the names of them. In fact, I think they're in numbers. Um, not all of them exist anymore, but we know we know what the names of them were. We know roughly where, where, they, were, where they were located. And they're finding more out about that all the time. Um, so, but they are listed in, in Scripture. Um, so this, again, is the map. And we find ourselves at the very end of Numbers, right here. Okay, Mount Nebo. Before they cross over, that's the, when they cross over the, the Jordan River into Canaan and take the first city they come to, which is Jericho, that's the start of the book of Joshua. All right? I want to talk about a couple of problems that we face in scholarship as we look at this book. And again, I talk about these problems not because I lack faith, but because if we're going to be scholars of this stuff, we have to know what's said about it. We have to be... We have to have at least some sense of the larger picture in terms of scholarship related to these things. One of the first problems that we run into is that uh, Moses is not clearly identified as the author of this book, as he is in some other places. Uh, and that has caused numbers, you know, there have been challenges to Mosaic authorship of all of the Pentateuch, of course, but numbers even more so. Um, in numbers, Moses is spoken of in the third person. Moses this and Moses that, instead of I, or, you know, there, there's no, you get into Deuteronomy, for instance, and it's first person. Moses is the speaker and the actor, not the one being spoken about. Uh, but it's been observed that there have been other leaders in history, like Julius Caesar, who, who, writing the history of his travels and whatnot, he's spoken the third person of himself. So um, it may have just been a literary style. We don't know about that. There is one place. Numbers 33.2 that says Moses wrote down their starting place stage by stage by command of the Lord. That's the only place we have in Numbers that gives an indication that, that Moses is involved in writing anything there. Um, whereas the other books have much more clear indication that Moses is instructed to write this stuff down so that there will be a record of all the different important pieces of the other parts of the Pentateuch. So that's something that caused, has caused question. But it used to be that it was common for... Uh, scholars to say there's no historical veracity or reliability or accuracy in the book of Numbers at all. It's all made up. You know, these, these aren't real places. They didn't really go here. None of that's acceptable. But the fact is that nowadays, because fairly recently, in the last 60 years or so, considerable evidence has come out um, archaeologically in, in terms of not just archaeology, they continue to find documents that are that are secreted away in monasteries and things that have records that go back a long way or that refer to even more ancient documents. So there's considerable support nowadays 
for the idea that numbers does actually constitute historical material. For example, um, recent studies have shown that lists of place names in numbers, which were not, you know, were not identified as real places, they have found those same place names in Egyptian texts from the late Bronze Age, which would probably be right around the time of the Exodus and the, and the Desert Wanderings. In other words, they have found the same names of the cities that are listed in numbers have been identified in documents from another country from the same time period, which is verification that there's accuracy in terms of what they're talking about. Before, they didn't even, they thought that they just made this up. It was just a story. Um, and so they now have uh, valid archaeological evidence that leads us to believe that there's consistency in this. It, it's also one of the claims that they used to make, used to be at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, that, that Moses didn't write this stuff because Moses couldn't have written. Moses didn't write. Well, they have found Hebrew writing from Egypt um, quite a bit, like 200 years earlier than the traditional view of the Pentateuch, the date of the Pentateuch. So, they have more and more evidence that's coming to light all the time. Surprising, you'd think they'd found it all by now or figured it all out by now. They're finding new stuff all the time that would seem to indicate that there's much more historical reliability to, uh, to this than anybody realized before. I think we also want to see, in terms of the purpose of numbers, um, we need to always think, and I've said this before, we need to think about Old Testament books in terms of how they would have been seen by the Jews that they were written for. Yes, we look back at them and we see a fulfillment in terms of um, understanding them in light of the coming of the Messiah, who is Jesus. And the fact that they were predictive of him and that Jesus is the fulfillment of so much of what was going on then. But we also need to understand how the Jews did that, because this had value to the Jewish people before Jesus came. And we need to understand that. First, I, I think there's probably three ways uh, that we can understand, or three horizons, it would be called, of interpretation for the book of Numbers especially. And that is, first, the book of Numbers, along with the rest of the Pentateuch, speaks to the Jewish previous history. It is a retelling. And as I told you earlier, Numbers is where God begins to draw together the various pieces. His promise that they would be a people. Well, they are a people, and they're not under oppression anymore. They're, they're their own group now. Um, they would be a people. They would be have a unique relationship and a covenant relationship with God, and they would have a land. Well, God has brought them out as a people. He has given them their covenant relationship in, in particular terms. He's given them the, the definition of what that means, and he's getting ready to take them into the land he's promised. So the Jews could look at the book of Numbers as being a, um, a summing up of their past history. It's also true that throughout Jewish history, uh, there are various other events that they interpreted in light of the Exodus and the desert wanderings, etc. For instance, um, when you get to the 500s BC and you have the fall of, it, of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, and the Israelites are taking it off into captivity in Babylon, they saw that as a new Egyptian captivity. In some ways, they would interpret it as a new wander, as a new wilderness experience. And so they looked to back to the Pentateuch and back especially to the wandering in the desert in Numbers as being a sign of God continuing presence and that God would still redeem them, would bring them back from exile. And they used that as something they could hold on to when they experienced the Babylonian exile and other times of difficulty. Even though the Israelites in Numbers didn't seem to get that God had demonstrated his faith to them, Numbers itself became a sign of that to the Jews later on. And then finally, the Jews looked at this and they saw it as a direction for future history. That God has still promised that they would be a people that they not only would be a people, but they would be a uniquely chosen people and that they would have a land. The Jews have always expected that that was something that was still in their future. The fulfillment of much of that, they believe, started in the 1940s. The giving of the land of Israel, the return of the Jews to Israel. That's not yet fulfilled, but they believe that, again, they look at numbers and the promises that started to come together in numbers as being something that is also their future. So it summed up their past. It was something they could see as reflecting a value set that they needed to be, they needed to hang on to in the present, and they see it as a fulfillment for the future. So this is a very important book in terms of Jewish expectation. Um, I want to talk for a minute. We mentioned this once before about uh, another problem we, a critical problem we run into, and that is with the numbers. We have two senses here. 
Red on the surface, the first census, which is supposed to identify the number of men, 20 years old and upward, who is able, and it says, everyone able to go to war in Israel. In other words, all the men of the right age and eligible to be soldiers. The first census counted 603,550. The second census in the 26th chapter identifies, um, oh, where's that number? 601,000, it's just slightly less. I had that number somewhere, I don't see it right now, but I think it's 601,000. Well, the problem is that typical is that men of that age should constitute 20 or 25% of the total population. If that's true and typical, then the Israelites in total would have been somewhere between two and a half to three million people. Even the most conservative estimates, lower estimates, would say they were at least two million people. Well, that's a problem. Because two million people, um, they, one person has identified that if they were walking like six abreast, when they crossed the Red Sea, by the time the last of them got out of the Red Sea, the first of them would be all the way up in Kadesh Barnea, <laughs> um, up here, okay? Because that's, that's a lot of people. They would, they would make a trail over 100 miles long. Um, if there had been that many Israelites, then there probably wouldn't have been enough room for them in the land of Goshen. In fact, if you look at all of these areas now, uh, all of the Canaanite areas, the Canaanite areas, uh, what used to be Canaan, all of this area now, add up all of their current population in the 21st century, it's not this much. So there's something wrong with those numbers. Um, there's, and, and there's four ways that we can approach trying to interpret how that, you know, why it says that many numbers. The first one is to take those numbers literally. Because after all, it does say that the Israelites were fruitful, they increased greatly, so much so that Pharaoh got scared that the Israelites were going to outnumber them and that they were going to join a foreign army if an army ever invaded them. Um, and the people who want to take it literally say, well, the Israelites got broken up into smaller groups, and so they were, they're were they not all traveling as one party. Or, uh, but the difficulties we run into with that is there's even scriptural indications. God says in Deuteronomy, the peoples of Canaan, um, God describes them as seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. So seven different nations would have had more than two to three million people living in just this area. Um, it couldn't support them. There's not enough room for that many people in that area. There aren't that many people there now. Um, and, and Yahweh, God says, again in Deuteronomy 7, it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart upon you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. Really? Two to three million people and you were the fewest of all the people? There's never been a time in history when there were that many people there. Um, so we run into a concern by trying to interpret it literally. Uh, also, the very simple fact that if they had two to three million people, 600,000 soldiers, Pharaoh would have been running for his life. He could not have held up against that. The most powerful armies we know about in that time period had 30,000 or 40,000 people. The largest we know about was 70,000. If the Israelites had had 600,000 men capable of going to war, they wouldn't have been hesitant about anything. Okay. Um, later on, when uh, Shalmaneser, the Assyrian king, conquers the north, uh, uh, or is conquering the north, King Ahab, the northern king, and this was at the very height of the northern kingdom of Israel's capabilities, they only, at that point, were able to field 10,000 soldiers. 10,000 soldiers and 2,000 chariots under Ahab. And that was the most that they would ever have been able to produce because that was the height of their power in terms of army and thing. So the numbers don't seem to quite play out right and, the, and there, there must be some other explanation for it. A second option would be that we can think of the figures and uh, the numbers in, in the book of Numbers as representing some sort of misplaced census list that got added later from the time of the monarchy. But that doesn't really solve the problem, it just moves it to a different time. And even then, it doesn't seem right. It seems like it's too many people. Marvin? Just on the side, I think the same problem comes up when David numbers the people and he gets 1.3 million soldiers. Um, exactly. It's a lot of people. They got a lot of people. And uh, the, the other potential answers, they say, well, not this, 
The other people who have other suggested answers say that it can be applied to the book of, you know, the book of Kings, for instance, where they've got different, very large soldier numbers, uh, as well as to, to the book of Numbers. A third option would be that the word translated thousands here, 602,000, could also be translated tribes, or if it was vocalized slightly differently, and again, this, when I say vocalized, remember Hebrew did not have any vowels. Um, and the vowels were necessary for vocalizing, and yet the same vowels, uh, the same consonants, which were written as the same word, if you use different vowels, means something different, okay? So if you use a different set of vowels than thousands, it could mean chieftains. So the idea is that perhaps instead of 603,000, it's 603 tribes or subsets, because you remember the Korahites, for instance, were a tribe underneath the tribe of Levi. They were, they were a family subset. Or it could mean that many chieftains. Um, this, this is one of the ones that they say that if we interpret it that way, that would apply not only to, to the question about numbers, but it would also apply, apply to the later numbers that come out of the monarchy when it suggests that David had you know, 1.3 million or whatever soldiers. Um, a four, and, and it doesn't require a radical rewriting of the, of the account. It's just a different translation of a word. And in that regard, it doesn't do vi nearly as much violence as just saying, ah, that's not right. That's not true. You know, we can't believe any of that. Uh, a fourth answer would be that this is not written as a literal historical kind of record, but rather is what's called an epic narrative, meaning that they would, they would intentionally, not maliciously, but still intentionally inflate numbers, and in this case, perhaps to show God's glory, to show God's greatness. You know, how many people he brought out of, out of Egypt, how many people he had blessed in making us a people, there was so many. And again, we don't get that because we think of history as being a very different kind of thing than what the Israelites did. They had purposes behind things. And if a person who, in, in Moses writing this or in it being recorded further on, it may have been that they felt the, mo the most important part was to demonstrate that God had fulfilled his promise to make them a great people. And so they use grand numbers, you know, like, and, and we do that all the time, all right? If I told you once, I had told you a million times. Really? Um, we do that kind of stuff all the time and don't think about it. Well, they may have done the same kind of thing. We don't know for sure, but there, someday we will. <laughs> and there, it is highly unlikely, and this is not a statement of lack of faith, it's a, state of, uh, a statement of lack of complete understanding. Um, we don't see any way that there could have been 301,000 or, or 601,000 or 603,000 soldiers because that would have created a body of people the likes of which that part of the world has never seen, even today. And all of the other descriptions of being the fewest of the people and smaller than seven tribes in Canaan, uh, the fact that Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army, you know, was they were fearful of Pharaoh's army, they're running from Pharaoh's army, etc., etc. There are all sorts of reasons why that doesn't seem quite right. Any question about that or comment about it? Pardon? I like to use the local villages to kind of get a sense of, you know, there's 20,000 people in Chapala, so an area that big for 20,000 or Aki he has about 15,000 people. And if you have 100,000 people, it gets pretty big. Well, if you're talking about two to three million people, it's even bigger, yeah. You know, you begin to see some of the concerns. Okay, major themes. Let's talk about themes for a minute. What are the major themes that we find in Numbers? I've already talked about the promise of God. God had promised a posterity, which is another way of saying a people, that Abraham would grow into a nation. And would, you know, when he didn't think he and Sarah could have any children, they were too old. But God had promised there would be prosperity, posterity, descendants. They would be a people and grow. He also promised that there would be a special covenant relationship, a divine human relationship between him and his people, which he fulfills in the covenant, the Mosaic covenant that he gives at Mount Sinai. And thirdly, that he would give them the land, the promised land, which um, he, God had always been prepared to do since the time of Abraham. The only thing that prevented it from happening in the, in the book of Numbers is a lack of faith. They did not believe that God would fulfill his promise or that he was powerful enough to or that he really meant it or whatever. They didn't believe God. And so they were punished for that. A second 
major theme is the presence of God. As I mentioned earlier, God made his presence available to the Israelites in their camp. He gave instructions for the construction of a portable tabernacle, for the construction of an Ark of the Covenant, and said that his presence would reside above that Ark of the Covenant and would be in their midst, and even gave a, a specific set of instructions for how they were to camp so that the presence of God would be right in the middle. And that when the time came for them to move, he would indicate that by the cloud going up, telling them it was time to pack up to move, and then leading them and telling them when to stop again. So God was present with them in the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Um, he demonstrated the fact that his promise of a covenant with them was not just uh, you know, technical words, not just theological words. He really was going to be with them. Despite the fact that over and over and over again, they offend God by simply violating their promise to him. And several times he threatens to not be present with them anymore, but he never withdraws his presence. Okay, so the presence of God is a major theme, and this is, this is a foundational principle that continues throughout all of the history of the Israelites. The third point is the providence and provision of God. God demonstrates by the bless you, bless you, uh, by the miraculous exodus, the plagues, the, the proof to Pharaoh, the parting of the Red Sea. He provides water in the wilderness in a number of occasions. He provides food in the wilderness, and yeah, they may got they may gotten they may have gotten tired of manna and quail, but it met their needs. Right? Uh, God didn't promise that they were they were going to be able to order from whatever menu they wanted, but He did provide for them. Um, he gave them guidance. He protected them against the Amalekites. He gave them instructions, which is a kind of providence uh, and provision. He established clear lines of leadership, first by giving them Moses and Aaron, and then by creating a very clear structure and a very clear leadership, uh, sort of, and, and making Joshua the heir to that leadership. Over and over and over, God provides for them. And in fact, in uh, Deuteronomy, um, we have the statement that Moses says in verse uh, Deuteronomy 8, verse 4, The clothes on your back did not wear out, and your feet did not swell these 40 years. So there are miraculous kinds of provisions taking place that we don't even read about in Numbers. We hear about later on the fact that their clothes didn't wear out, their feet didn't swell. Okay. Um, Ride an airplane and see if your feet swell. Well, they went 40 years because they didn't ride any airplanes. But they did not have those difficulties. Um, a miraculous kind of provision. When there was a need for uh, water, God provided it miraculously out of the rock, even though in one of those cases, as I say in number 20 at uh, Meribah, Moses um, offends God. Again, I don't want to say angers because God does not respond angrily, but he offends God by not being obedient bringing forth the water. God still provides the water. The very fact that God had given legal provisions outlined both in Leviticus and also into Numbers shapes the Israelites' worship. It uh, gives them a sense of what it means to be a nation. As I said, these passages, Exodus, uh, Levitica, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, there's a lot of content in all of them, not just Exodus, that talks about the law. And that law was the Constitution. It's what made them not just a people, but a nation, as we've discussed before. And God was gracious in providing that to them. Um, we then have evidence as a major theme of the patience of God. One of the primary assertions that is made about God throughout all of the Old Testament is that the Lord is patient and long-suffering. Well, the book of Numbers really demonstrates that. God puts up with... with one failing after another after another. He actually responds in judgment quite seldom compared to the number of times that he um, he's offended because of blatant disregard for the covenant agreement they had. You'll remember that when God spoke to Moses first, he said, go and tell the people, this is what I want. This is the kind of covenant I want to have with you. And it says, and all of the people said, yes, we agree with that. All of the people, it said. And yet the people over and over and over again, they they defy God, they betray God's love for them, they betray their relationship, they do things they were clearly told they were not supposed to do, and yet God does not destroy them. Um, God is patient with the Israelites, He is patient with Moses. Uh, 
he shows that he is long-suffering and loving, even when they don't deserve it. And even the fact that God acted first. God did not say, okay, you guys do all these things, and if you meet the mark, if you, if you qualify, then I will do great things for you. No, God did the great things for them first, and then said, in response to what I have done for you, here is how, if we're going to be covenant together, here's how you need to live. And that's the part that they broke over and over again. They rebelled, they complained, uh, they, Miriam and Aaron grumbled against Moses' wife and against Moses. Uh, they were jealous of him. The spies didn't trust God. Oh, and here's what it was. The Israelites wanted to go back to Egypt because they wanted to eat fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Mediterranean diet. Um, and they whined and they complained and they grumbled and they backbit. I did. Um, they, they tried to undermine authority and leadership and over and over and over. And the fact that God didn't just annihilate them is a sign of God's patience. We also have the theme of intercession that comes up over and over again. In the book of Leviticus that we looked at last week, God demonstrates that the people's holiness, there's a couple of ways that people can become holy. One primary way is through sacrifice. People are made holy through sacrifice. But part of that is by intercession. It is the high priest who acts for them. It is, it is those that God has chosen have the authority and, and responsibility even to intercede for the people, not only by sacrifice, but by prayer. Um, as I said earlier, it is Moses that convinces God on at least two occasions not to destroy the Israelites. He intercedes for them. Um, when Miriam and Aaron's jealousy flares up against Moses, Miriam is judged by being receiving leprosy from God. It is Moses that says, Lord, forgive them. Aaron goes to Moses and says, To Moses, O Lord, do not punish us for a sin we have so foolishly committed. And Moses prays to God, O God, please heal her. Um, he did heal her after seven days of having to be outside the camp. She comes back. Um, over and over and over, especially Moses, but also Aaron and the priest, they demonstrate for us the power of intercession that God will anoint and appoint people. And because we as Protestants believe in the priesthood of all believers, we all have that responsibility now. We are all part of the priesthood now. We have the responsibility to intercede for others in prayer. But, and that's a major theme that comes out in the book of Numbers. We also have Yahweh and the nations. Um, the idea, what this means is that God is the ruler of all the nations, not just the Israelites, even though he has a special relationship with them. Um, this idea really begins here in, um, well, it began in the relationship with Pharaoh in Egypt, that God was in control there too. It's demonstrated here in uh, Numbers, and it continues as a theme that really gets fulfilled in the Isaiah, when God uses the Assyrians to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, and later the Babylonians to take the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity. Those are all demonstrations of the fact that God is the God of all nations, whether they recognize him or not. In Numbers particularly, we have the case of um, the story of Balak and Balaam that I talked about before. Balak is the, um, the king of the Amorites, and the, so when the people are coming up toward Moab, um, he wants to do something about it. And the, I'm sorry, Sihon is the king of the Amorites. Balak is the king of the Moabites. They defeat the Amorites, they get into the land of Moab, and so knowing that they were powerful enough to defeat the southern kingdoms, the king of Balak, the king of Moab, gets Balaam the prophet. The Mesopotamian prophet apparently was renowned for his ability to pronounce effective curses. He would curse people, and bad things would happen to them. So Balak gets him and says, okay, you need to curse these Israelites for us because they're, they're doing a good job of fighting and we don't want to have to be defeated by them. But Yahweh God tells Balaam that he is not to curse Israel. In fact, he is to bless them. He ends up blessing them three times. And again, when Balaam tries to deny God's instructions and go off in a different direction, God sends an angel who only Balaam's ass can see, and the donkey won't move forward. Balaam starts beating him for not moving forward, and the donkey talks to him and says, can you not see there's an angel here? You know. Balaam ends up giving three great blessings and several lesser blessings to the Israelites, and they are victorious over the Moabites. But later on, apparently the same guy, Balaam, he's called Balaam the son of Beor, 
Uh, later on, he apparently aligns himself with the Midianites, and he is involved in enticing the Israelites to sin against God by worshiping Baal of Peor and by various kinds of ritual prostitution. And therefore, when the Israelites fight against the Midianites, uh, Balaam is killed. We don't know what happened to his ass, you know, but Balaam is killed in battle um, after defying God. So this is one of the early examples we have in Scripture of God clearly demonstrating that he has authority over all nations. That just because he's chosen this small group to be his special chosen people does not mean he is not, does not have authority over everybody. Okay. Um, any questions about any of that? And I know you got all of this out of it when you read Numbers, right? You figured all that out. <laughs> Numbers is kind of a confusing book, you know. It's a lot of different literary styles. It doesn't have it's a very consistent flow. It kind of jumps around a whole lot, and so it's it's hard to read. Rod, right? what's the clue that all these good things are done and they're still just written? Believe it. Well, we do the same thing. Not quite. Well, yeah, for sure. We yeah. Have to learn that. Look at all the blessings in your life. Where do you think they came from? Do we give credit all the time for where, where they should have been? Now, we think of all these things as being miraculous, but um, human beings have an astonishing ability to, to make up explanations that don't give God credit for it. And I think that's a lot of what we saw happening. Oh, we could probably have defeated the Egyptians anyway. Well, probably just a big win because of water we push back there. I think we could have whipped the, we, you know, the Amalekites on our own. Who needed Moses holding his arms up? Oh, that water was there all the time. If we just looked hard, we would have found it. You know, is that not the way people talk? Is that not the way people think? No matter how big the miracle may seem to be, or or, or complain about anything, or it complain about big it. enough that wasn't fast enough, it wasn't. Heaven knows that's easy true. enough. You know, it's yeah. Just, well, that's like he he said an example with your friends that you asked him something, he revealed it, and you have to make it. A decision to believe that you truly have a relationship and you talk to God and He show you things. Yep. And, you have to and then you listen and you then follow. You, you don't say, Well, God, give me the answer. God, give me the answer. You know, it's, it's that joke I told you about somebody you asked God to, when the an Irish sweepstakes, and then finally God said, well, you could at least buy a ticket. I mean, we expect God to do miraculous things, but we don't feel any responsibility. And when God does do miraculous things, we find excuses for it. We find some way of explaining it away. Oh, that could have been. Why are we surprised when that prayer is answered? Yeah, exactly. Why are we surprised? How often, think about this for yourself, how often do we ask God for something, and we get it, and it never occurs to us to thank Him for it? Oh, I'm sure glad that happened. <laughs> kind of like asking for it, please. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's the story you know, that, that that we have of the, you know, Jesus healed the ten, and only one came back to say thank you. And he said, "Where are the other nine? Folks, we are the other nine. Nine times out of ten, literally, we ask for things. God blesses us with things in response to to our requests, and yet we don't even bother to thank Him. It doesn't occur to us that that was an answer to that prayer I made. We just assume it all worked out." Mysterious. Mary. I like the story of the man who was running out of time and he had to find a parking spot. He couldn't find a parking spot. Went round and round. And he prayed, Oh God, help me find a parking spot. And he went around again and there was a parking spot. And he said, Thanks God, I don't need it now. I got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? Right. Didn't the time come when God didn't want him to take any more census? Well, he, it's true. Uh, later on when they started doing the census, God was offended by that. And the, but the indication was that it was a sign of lack of faith then. Like, oh, are we really strong? Do we have enough men? Are we strong enough? Can we do this? And God said, I didn't tell you to do that. Uh, so yes, there is a situation that God was offended because it was a demonstration of lack of faith is why they had a census. Relying on himself. Exactly. Thinking, do we have enough resources in ourselves, completely apart from thinking that God is living in Okay? Pardon? And that's the story of Gideon, where he got, 
trip to down so low that they had to know it was him. Absolutely, yeah. Don't take your whole army, take half that many. You know, yeah. get it down to just the, a very few. So. Okay, folks, thank you.